Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, it is a pleasure to be here. And I, I really feel like this is our rock star moment yet, coming out into this stage, which is fabulous, to talk about how gaming shapes reality. Now, many people think of it just as a form of entertainment. I remember sitting in my bedroom with a Nintendo. Things have absolutely changed since those days. Um, Yatsu, fantastic to meet you. You're the founder and executive chairman of Animoca Brands, as you've just been introduced there, also by Edie, thank you. Let's start by dispelling the stereotypes to start with, please. Well, first of all, um, the average gamer is about 35 years of age, so it's not just our children that are playing games. Um, half of the world's gamers are female, they're women, right? and especially in the kingdom as well, I think it's almost 47 or 48 percent. The other thing is that gaming is larger than movie and music business combined, about $200 billion as an industry. And another fun fact is that esports gamers typically are 21 percent more healthier and more fit than your average person. Wow. So there's not a case of just sitting in your bedroom. No, absolutely. It. Couch potatoes, that's something from maybe 30 years ago. How would you say gaming influences culture and identity? I mean, it, these days, it really does infiltrate every aspect of our lives. Gaming is a predominant culture, particularly for youth, right? It's not, you know, movies used to be that, and to some extent television, but people don't really sort of look at the newspaper as much, or people don't really sort of read books in the same way. Games is a predominant form of culture. We spend around 10 to 11 hours a day on average, basically online, of which a big part of it is gaming. There's 3.4 billion people who play games. That's more than roughly two thirds of the world's internet today. Wow. And they consume all that time gaming. So that's your form of culture absorption. And the culture absorption isn't just content that you see, it's also social. Speaking a little bit about the myths, you know, some people think that I'm playing a game and I'm a loner and I'm just doing it by myself. The most popular games are social. You sure. play with your friends, and the glue isn't the game content. The glue is my friends, my social communities, who I'm hanging out with. And that's really the paradigm that's changed here. So that reality is true for them. When you play a game, and you have real excitement, you feel real passion, anger, frustration, love, all these things you feel truly inside games. These are real feelings to you. These are not fake feelings. What do you take away from that gaming community? Do they have much influence in what you develop and what you make? So in the traditional form of gaming, actually there isn't that much influence that gamers have because it's still used as a form of consumption. So you make games as a form of content. That's the old way of gaming. Sure. But the future form of gaming you know, is basically where you have ownership. And that's where non-fungible tokens and blockchain comes in. Because you know, one of the biggest games that is very popular, for instance, in this region is Fortnite. Tons of money is being spent on these gaming assets, on the skins and all these items that you buy inside the games. But what you purchase in the games don't belong to you. They actually are rented. Yeah. But ask a gamer, you know, whether they're renting their assets or whether they're owning them, they will tell you, I think I own this, don't I? But in reality, they don't. So the future of gaming is one where you actually own your assets because you own your time as well. The things I purchase should be mine, shouldn't it? Because I'm spending billions of dollars in this industry. Last year, 100, over $110 billion was spent on virtual goods in gaming, but they were entirely rental. What happens when you actually take those and turn them into real assets, which is now possible with NFTs. We're not talking about just a small increase. You're going from fake rights to actual real digital property rights. You're talking about a magnification of value that potentially, in terms of you know, ways that you can use these assets in other games as well. It's interesting as well, I think, where it's not just a case of taking part of the game. You can actually earn from it. You can make money. Yes, so one of our earliest portfolio companies, uh, Axie Infinity, for instance, uh, created effectively millions of employment in, uh, in the Philippines. Yeah. In, the rural, uh, in the rural areas of the Philippines where you, they were unbanked, because you know, a bank couldn't give them a banking service, they can't have a credit card, but they can have a crypto wallet in which they can basically transact on their time and get value from that. And this is the thing, games create value for people. When I'm playing a game, even if I'm not paying any money, I'm playing and interacting with another player who might give value into the system. That's why he's paying. After all, you can't play a game just by yourself. So that value now is being shared to the community. And I actually think the future of work is going to exist in the metaverse, in gaming, for instance, where you know, we went from the first stage where you went into virtual development. So you were making games, you were making apps. 10 years ago, the app economy was a $0 economy. Now it's a $5 trillion economy. The next step is going to take that from where we are today, which is 
you know, people who are making this a reality to people who are inside this reality. So people basically buying virtual real estate, which is doing sandbox, HSBC, Standard Chartered, for instance, oh. Gucci, Prada, all these brands have bought land in sandbox, for instance, which is again, one of our metaverses. And there they build experiences to attract their audiences and it's their reality. It's the reality of this generation. I mean, looking at the technology and like you say, what is reality? What is now? We've got the metaverse, you know, it's how do you keep on top of it? You know, because it's moving at such a rapid scale. Well, I'd say this to everyone, if you want to enter the space, you have to be there. I, you know, I've, I live in Hong Kong and typically when people outside would tell me, well, you know, how does this work in China? We don't understand it, but we want to sell to this market. It seems like an opportunity. I tell everyone the same thing. You have to go there, right? You have to enter that world because you can't just sell something there. It's the same for me when I came to, to Riyadh for the first time. I didn't understand anything about this and I was blown away and I learned a lot about the space and maybe began to understand it better. The metaverse is just the same. If you want to understand the metaverse, if you want to be there, maybe sell products or engage with the next generation, you have to be there. And the perfect lens to do that really is through your children. In some ways, if you can see what your children love to do, ask them what they want for Christmas. They probably want something virtual. Very likely, they want something digital because that's their identity. They don't care about the physical things as much, they care about the virtual things. Do you think though that the virtual will eventually overtake the physical? Are we at risk of that? And how do you foresee that happening? I actually don't think there is a risk of that because we already exist virtually. Think about the things you purchase. How much of the clothes you wear or the cars you buy or the houses you live in comes from the fact that it's physical? The value of a Birkin bag or the value of your Ferrari maybe or maybe whatever car you purchase is 99% a, 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 a non-utilitarian, completely sort of societal uh, sort of value that comes from virtual because of its network effects, because of you know, how famous it is or whatever. And the same is true in gaming assets. People covet, for instance, gaming skins or gaming assets because it denotes a kind of status. It says something about themselves. So, you know, consumption is actually something that says something about who we are. And since we exist most of our time virtually, for instance, it may matter to us more how many likes we get on Instagram than it may matter where we are seen physically, as an example. So that means that we're already denoting our value in virtual terms. So I think it's just a natural evolution of where we're going. As it becomes more accessible, what kind of impact do you think it will have on humanity? So I think the impact it can have in humanity in the context of Web3, I think is foundational because right now, when you're actually playing a game or when you're on the platform, say like Facebook or something, none of that time belongs to you. But in Web3, you actually, through a form of tokenization, actually become a member of that community. For instance, if you own land in a virtual game, say like the Sandbox, if the ecosystem grows, you get the benefit from that. But right now, in the old way of gaming, you're basically simply just a consumer. So the future, what it is for Web3 and blockchain gaming is it introduces a kind of stakeholder capitalism where every player actually is someone who gets to benefit from the growth of the activity that they themselves have given to the ecosystem as opposed to today where they're being completely extracted. You mentioned there's some pretty impressive figures in terms of how many people are into their gaming. You know, do you see much variation geographically? Well, actually gaming is pretty universal. Uh, I mean, if even some place like, like here in, in Saudi was, you know, the average population is, you know, um, under the age of 30, the majority, most of them play games. That seems to be a universal truth around the world. Uh, in Asia, which is about uh, more than world's, uh, half of the world's uh, sort of gamers, you know, they're all ex excited about games. So I think it's a universal language. It's a kind of, you could view it almost like a sport. So a few things unite us from a cultural standpoint, right? And if you think about them, they are games of their own. Even sport is a kind of game. And in this case, games is the ultimate game, perhaps. You mentioned backstage, we had a lovely little chat, and you told me about what got you into this career. You start out in music, which probably yes, right. people well, might be surprised at. Yeah, I, I grew up in Vienna. I studied classical music. Uh, this was in the 80s. I'm completely dating myself. And my first job was with Atari. So that's how I got into the gaming industry. And back then already, it was more single player gaming. But the form of gaming that we had was that we would gather around in the living room and that was social, right? We would play and compete and, you know, you know my mom and you know, my friends would gather around physically. Now we've just extended that where gaming is not any, an activity that you do inside a living room as a community. Now it's the whole world. You can en engage and interact. And in some ways I actually think it's a, a net positive because you could be playing with a high school kid, with a teacher, a CEO, a billionaire, 
they're all in the gaming world actually in, in that sense the same and they can be together. I actually think gaming can enhance diversity. What do you think is going to be the biggest challenge for your industry in the next five years? I mean, I think the biggest challenge in any industry that's growing that fast is that you have to make sure that the actors in the space are doing the right thing because there's so much money involved in the space that naturally there'll be elements of, you know, players that might sort of be more extractive for the other. Um, there used to also be a generational shift because gaming is something that maybe older people would view. I think the, the risk, I think, is more of a generational danger of people not understanding gamers. Parents typically are worried about their children playing games because they say they're just stuck on the screen, they, you know, they don't come on time for their lunch, they don't do their homework, they, you know, they don't care about the physical world. It's a common complaint. But the issue is not the fact that it's an issue, it's the fact that as parents, older generation parents anyway, are not equipped to understand the virtual world. Sure. They don't play these games. You know, we used to play sports, so we understand the context of sports. We watch our kids swim or play tennis or, or play football. These are the rules we understand so we can engage this way. But in the gaming context, you know, how many parents here are playing Fortnite with their kids, for instance? Who's doing Minecraft, for instance? So there's a generational shift there. But I think you can bridge that understanding by just entering their world. What do you think are the opportunities here in the region we're in here? So I think it's an incredible opportunity for the kingdom and for the MENA region. Gaming is, uh, I actually think that the place here for gaming is the Web3 element, basically blockchain gaming, NFTs, I think is the future for this area. Yeah because you can have a leapfrog effect. One famous example of this is you know, Finland, today a mobile gaming powerhouse. But 10 years ago, Finland was really nobody in gaming. The gaming centers were in the US, in the UK, you know, EA, Activision, all those big companies that are still big companies today. But they all said, mobile gaming, we don't think that's the future, we're not gonna focus on that. And they left the field wide open to new players. And a tiny little country like Finland became a mobile gaming leader with companies like Supercell, and Rovio, Angry Birds, right? And blockchain gaming is the same. We believe blockchain gaming, Web3, is the future of gaming. And the level, the playing field is level for all. In other words, there is an opportunity to basically be a leader instead of being a follower. If you're trying to copy basically what other gaming companies are doing in the world that have had decades of experience, you can certainly do it. It will take longer and you're playing a very different kind of game. I think the leapfrog game, I think, suits this area better. You talked earlier about the challenges probably over the next five years. What are you most excited about? So I'm most excited about how gaming can teach children. Sure. Play is the way that we all teach children, if you think about it. Where do our children play? They play online. But there's one difference here. In blockchain gaming, they can learn about financial systems. They can learn about economics. If you can teach our children algebra at the age of 10, you can teach them a little bit about finance. You can teach them about sort of managing elements of risk in a very small way. Right? When people trade cards, for instance, they learn about economics and trade as well. Most of the youth today learns nothing about the world of economics and finance until they get to maybe college. And in the West, for instance, most of them have debt, which is a very horrible way to experience the world of finance, shall we say. But they've never been trained. And I actually think, for instance, the real world sort of dynamics, the game of life, as it were, could actually be experienced in the perfect simulation in a safe way so we can prepare our children better for the future. Very, very quickly, if you could go back in time and give yourself one bit of advice when you started into this career, what would that be? Actually, I wouldn't change anything because I think all my past experiences shape who I am today. So I'm very grateful for everything I've had before. Yes, you. thank you so much for your time today. And thank you to our audience. Please don't go anywhere. Next, we have engineer Ar Oh, we don't have it. I'm sorry. I've just heard that there's been a slight change to the schedule, but please don't go anywhere because we have lots coming up as we finish day three of the Future Investment Initiative here in Saudi. Thank you all so much for your time here this afternoon for this session.